Reading from 1 Corinthians, chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, and do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. A reading from the book of John, chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. 
By this everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. One of the most popular film of the 1970s, Eric Siegel's Love Story, has regularly been categorized as, as one of the best romantic dramas of the 20th century. Uh, for those who know me, it should be of little surprise that I've not seen this movie. I haven't seen a lot of movies. Uh, frankly, I find it tedious to sit through something for more than an hour. Uh, and I should note that Love Story was released a decade before my coming into this earth. But despite all this, I, I do know the tagline for this production. It's love story. Love means never having, having to say you're sorry. Now, I don't know how valid this sentiment is, but something tells me saying I'm sorry is an important feature of love. But the, the point being that there are lots of people who have lots of opinions on the subject of love. 
The Beatles said, all you need is love. Tennyson declared that it is better to love and to, uh, it is better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. Tina Turner asked the question, what's love got to do with it? Um, as a kid, if we had a memorized Shakespeare sonnet, sonnet 116, let me not to the marriage of true minds and impediments. Love is not love, which alters, which an alteration finds, or bends when the remover to remove. It is an ever fixed mark, and so on. And, and for all my ninth grade classmates who defiantly asked Mrs. Goods why we needed to memorize poetry, I could proudly say that I've finally used this little poetic nugget in a real life situation. So take that. Well, I hope that these are more favorable expressions of love than what Ger George Burns meant when he said, love is like a toothache. It doesn't show up on x-rays, but you know it's there. Of course, that all ties in this morning with church, being that George Burns played God himself on no less than three occasions. And for some reason in my youth, I watched on multiple occasions, Oh God, Oh God, Book Two, and Oh God, You Devil. Um, it, it may explain my interest in theology, but equally it very well may be the reason why I don't like movies as an adult. I still do like John Denver some, for some reason, so maybe that's not it. Well, anyway, our epistle reading from this morning comes from the Apostle Paul in, in his great peon of love found in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Love is patient, love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not, re, it's not irritable or resentful, and so on. And in the annals of world history, this chapter may indeed be the most quoted text concerning love. We should all be familiar with this. Uh, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is read at just about every wedding ceremony. You could find these words printed on coffee mugs or, or stenciled on decorative ship lath for, for wall hangings. And, and like all familiar scripture, we run the danger of being too familiar with the text. Indeed, we think of these words of Paul, uh, to quote Maisie Foda, we think of these words of Paul as being the, the comfy cozy chapter in the New Testament. I'm not too sure if comfy cozy was what the great apostle was getting at. You see, first off, Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, who, as we know from previous and subsequent chapters, are a church who are struggling with envy and arrogance and patient unkindness. They're a group of Christians who quarreled about spiritual gifts. They were jealous of others' talents or their status or their abilities, envious of what others possessed, dissatisfied with their own spiritual gifts, uh, perhaps prideful in their own gifts. I dare say that uh, the church has not changed too much over two millennia. The church is and, and probably will be a group of Christians who, who never quite fully live up to these ideals that Paul writes about. And that's why we still read this chapter today. This is not a list of characteristics that are theoretical. They are characteristics that are practical and that need practice. This is not to say that once we've mastered this list in 1 Corinthians 13, that only then do we become saved Christians. No, it's not even an exhaustive list. The features of love are something exhibited by the Christian because we are saved. In other words, this is not an exercise in perfectionism. That's not the point. But these words do serve as, as reminders of what we can become when we decide to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, Paul, what Paul describes is not only what we can be, but these characteristics are who Christ is. And Jesus is patient. Jesus is kind. Jesus is not envious, boastful, or arrogant, or rude. And I think we could understand that. The, the uncomfortable part for us, it's not when we substitute love for, for Jesus or Jesus for love. The uncomfortable part for, for all of us is when we put our name where the word love arrives. It's, it's a, a very troubling exercise. Can we really declare that I am patient, I am kind, I am not irritable or resentful, I do not rejoice in wrongdoings, I bear all things, I endure all things? And so, in order for the Holy Spirit to work within us this morning, we'll attempt to go through Paul's characteristics of love so that we may see our pitfalls, that we may reflect on our improvements, 
and that we could realize the, the need for God's love and God's grace within each of us. Uh, the first thing Paul says is that love is patient. Love is patient. For those who, like myself, had dealings with the U.S. Postal Service this Christmas, you should be immediately acquainted with the word uh, patient. That's not what Paul's referring to. Paul means that love is patient with people. We're patient with each other. And that's a whole different animal, isn't it? We, we may have to endure slow shipping times, but eventually we hope our, our package will come to the post office. But when we love a person, not only do we need to accept where they are at the moment, but we can never really be sure when or if a person changes. Perhaps they don't need change. Perhaps it's, it's us who need change. Uh, but the fact is that if we're not prepared to endure a relationship through good times and bad, then we may need to re-examine our hearts. Uh, perhaps you have a friend who, who, who needs to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Their life is restless, their demeanor irritable, their decisions unwise. But we love that person because through a relationship with Jesus Christ, their potential is limitless. Do we simply give up on someone because they disappoint us? Because they, they won't take our advice? Because they've turned their backs on God? No, Paul says love is patient. And we often have to suffer with someone in order to exhibit that love. You see, we often love a person for what they can be and not for their current situation. And this is precisely the sort of patience that God shows towards us, his creation. In our opening psalm, we, we read that the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And if there's one takeaway from our study this morning, it's that, that our God is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. For as many times as we have or, or continue to disregard his holy laws, for all the times that we've placed our, our jobs, our careers, youth sports, reading the Sunday paper, for all the times we put what we want to do before what God needs us to do, despite all our, our laziness, our indifference, our rebellion, God still calls us to return home. For those who've watched our Ash Wednesday service this week, you'll be familiar with what God says through his prophet Joel. Even now, says the Lord, Return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Rend your hearts and not your clothing. Return to the Lord your God. And this is what Joel says next. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Joel's quoting right from Psalm 103. Now, if, if we were to take this portion of the Old Testament from the King James Version, We'll notice that it reads, Turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness. Those words, of great kindness. And that is our second characteristic of love. Love is kind. I think we could all agree that it's not very difficult to be kind to kind people. Someone who is considerate and genial, a person with a positive attitude, we say that these sorts of people naturally deserve our, kind, our kindness, and, and rightfully so. But let us consider what Jesus teaches in Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount. He says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. He continues, For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Those words sting, don't they? Jesus is saying that kindness and love are not situational. It, it may, in fact, be easy to show kindness towards the poor and the suffering. But when it comes to the hedge fund billionaire, we often just sneer with derision. It may be easy to show kindness to those who appreciate us and thank us. It's altogether different when we interact with those who seem ungrateful or dismissive. It's easy for the Democrat to be kind towards other Democrats or Republicans to be kind towards other Republicans, but how challenging it is to show love and kindness to people 
whom you disagree politically. Now, I don't have to spend much time explaining that in our present day divided America that political tribalism lacks even, even the most basic understanding of kindness. Well, how about the church? As a church, we need to ask ourselves, are, are we being kind to one another when disagreements arise? Like the church in Corinth, to whom Paul writes, there was and there will be disputes and debates. There's disputes and debates on things like money and missions and programs. But we, a people of God, as we hash these things out, we need to be absolutely committed to love and kindness. For God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness. Love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious or boastful. They say that there's two types of people in this world, the uh, fabulously wealthy and those who wish to be fabulously wealthy. We talked about envy at length with our series, The Seven Deadly Sins, this past fall. And for those who are with us, you'll recall that there is nothing sinful when we admire someone else's gifts whether it's material possessions, their abilities or their talents, or even their good looks. But envy is when we desire what another person has to the point where we develop cold and unloving hearts, when we fantasize over an object or a person, when we're prepared to take that which doesn't belong to us. In this church that Paul's writing to, a great source of animosity came from envy, in particular, uh, the envy of spiritual gifts. Some members of the church were gifted at preaching, others had the gift of prophecy, others spoke in tongues. I imagine that there were more than a few talented musicians. Perhaps they had the first Christian bake sale and her pie sold faster and earned more compliments than any other pie makers. Uh, but I, I'm sure there were many like in our church today who, who worked quietly behind the scenes cleaning, fixing, praying, sending cards, encouraging one another. Paul addresses this in the preceding chapter, chapter 12, where he describes the local church as a literal body of Christ. God has placed each part in the body just as he wanted it to be. If all parts were the same, how could there be a body? As it is, there are many parts, but there is only one body. If we want to show love Within the church, then we need to find out where we fit, what our talents are, where we could be of ultimate use for the service of God and to our community. I tell you now, out of three churches, I have yet to encounter too many body parts. If anything, there's certain body parts that are regularly overworked. And the last thing I want to say about envy is that an envious heart is not a thankful heart. We are all blessed in, in certain unique ways, but we're not, not all blessed the same or with the same measure. There will always be somebody who's richer or taller or better looking, a better baseball player, a smarter student. There will always be better preachers. If we're not satisfied with the gifts that we're given, then what we're saying to God is, you're not enough. And if God is not enough for us, then, then there's no hope. Love is not boastful or arrogant. Last week I was doing a search on Kindle when it came across this book titled Tracing Your Aristocratic and Royal Ancestors. And the author seeks to help people to uh, people of European extraction to, to trace some sort of connection to European royalty. Well, it seems to me that uh, if one is not immediately aware of their royal lineage, then a book like this will only prove more distant and more tenuous claims to a particular throne. But the point of books like these are, are not that John Doe can inherit a title someday. No, the point of the exercise is, is ultimately a function of boasting. So we could say, you know, I, I'm a descendant of Richard III or, or whatever. Now, for those who are interested in such matters, I, I have some great news for you this morning. If you are predominantly of European ancestry, then you, yes, you, are a descendant of, of perhaps the most famous king of Europe. You're a descendant of Charlemagne. And it's really quite simple. You figure that each of us have four grandparents and each of those grandparents have four grandparents. And so if you do the math and you go back like 800 or 1,000 years, 
you soon have more ancestors than people alive. Uh, well, anyway, back to the Corinthian church. Uh, I'm sure we're related to people in the Corinthian church. The, the church in Corinth were dealing with arrogance and, and boasting. I have the gift of tongues, and, and you hardly say a word. It's like some Bible studies we may have been, been a part of. Or, or, I clearly have more faith than you. I heard a comment once within our church of someone saying, I must love Jesus more than you. And you're like, wait a minute, that, that doesn't sound too Christian. Yeah, it's, it's not Christian. Listen to how Paul begins this section. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but I do not have love, I'm nothing. Now, bragging that you're descended from Richard III is one thing. It may be annoying. But, but claiming to be more spiritual than someone else will, will tear a church apart, even if it only affects that one person. I've put boasting and arrogance under the same heading, but just a practical word about arrogance. Uh, the word Paul uses in, in Greek, it translates arrogance as puffed up. As a society, we are in danger of having so many puffed up people that will soon run out of room for all the big heads walking around. Uh, in a culture that disregards biblical wisdom and regularly disparages any biblical worldview, we're morphing into one nation under God to one nation full of gods. Now, I do think it's important to raise our children in a positive, loving, and encouraging environment, but insisting that your child is, is the greatest thing to ever have walked the earth, that'll soon develop into, into a, a, an outsized and, a, and irrational sense of importance. I think our community will would be far better served when, when parents lay off some of their praise and applause and teach their children about prayer, gratitude, and Christian love. Well, there are 15 attributes of love that Paul gives us in 1 Corinthians 13, and we've only made it about halfway. And being that our time is, is almost gone, um, I'm going to say we're going to pick this up next week and we're going to uh, finish this list. Now, this being the first Sunday in Lent, the prescribed lectionary readings do not include 1 Corinthians chapter 13. In fact, this has traditionally been the reading for the Sunday before Ash Wednesday. But you see, as we prepare for the day of resurrection, the, the, the story of God's plan of salvation through Jesus Christ, it's, it's all about love. It's about kindness and patience. It's about truth endurance it's about hope and I, th I think it's well appropriate for us to spend another Sunday on this great chapter as the apostle writes love never ends but as for prophecies they will come to an end as for tongues they will cease as for knowledge it will come to an end for we know only in part and what we prophesy only in part but when the complete comes the partial will come to an end Love never ends. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Holy Spirit working through your servant Paul. We thank you for the church who has preserved what God tells us about love. And we confess to you that we've not always followed Jesus. We have not exhibited Christian love at times. We've failed in representing Christ, especially within his most holy church. Help us this week as we read and reread these words. May, the, may they be a reminder of who we are in Christ and an affirmation of who you are. For you, O oh God, are gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Amen. How deep the Father's love for us How vast beyond all measure That He should give His only Son 
Father turns his face.